1914, during World War I, the German military burned the Belgian Olven Library to the ground. And they then, that same year, bombarded the Rance Cathedral in France. Both of these acts were against the Hague Conventions, which had been established in the decades leading up to the war. These conventions were a lot like the Geneva Convention treaties, in that they laid out how prisoners of war should be treated, they stated that militaries cannot force captive citizenry into military service, and they forbade the use of poisons in combat. Interestingly, there's also a provision which declares that for a period of five years after the signing of the document, None of the signatory powers will launch projectiles or explosives from balloons. And notably, this particular provision about balloon explosives was signed by everyone except the United Kingdom and the United States. But back to the main story. Germany defied these conventions, the Hague Conventions which in addition to no poisons and no bombs from balloons, also stated that invaders in wartime will protect the cultural property of those they are invading. So you can take over the cities and you can kill the soldiers, but you do not burn their libraries and you do not shell their cathedrals. Amidst the international and internal backlash from these two acts, the German government created a concept they called Kunstschutz, which means roughly Art protection. This was, it should be noted, a creation of their propaganda department. So although the efforts under this header technically involved less burning and pillaging and bombing of cathedrals, it also wasn't done for particularly noble reasons. The Kunstschutz crew would sweep into a village or a city before or after it was destroyed and would pack up and ship out whatever artwork they could find. That artwork would typically be taken back to Germany, and in most cases, quote-unquote, protection to this group meant keeping that artwork safe and sound in the possession of Germany. Some of these pieces were eventually returned to their original owners or creators, but a lot of them were only returned after decades or not at all. Some of the ones that were returned came back to their place of origin as late as the year 2000. And those are for pieces that were taken during the First Great War in the 19-teens. After World War I, Hitler, who fancied himself a connoisseur of art, declared that any art he didn't find beautiful, or in the image as he saw it, of German cultural purity, would be gotten rid of. This meant especially... German modernist works like those falling under the header of Dadaism or Cubism or Futurism or Expressionism, anything that wasn't done realistically according to the old traditions of ideal form and ideal landscapes. And he labeled anything that didn't fall into those ideal categories as degenerate art. He put on a show at the Haus der Kunst in Munich in 1937 inviting visitors to come and publicly mock the 16,000 or so works that had been confiscated and which were to be removed from German soil, these degenerate artworks. But attempts to sell these works to raise money for the German coffers failed, probably in part at least, because the attendees were not inclined to buy artwork that they were told was degenerate in the eyes of the state. So in the year 1939... The government set fire to over 1,000 paintings and sculptures and nearly 4,000 watercolors, prints, and drawings from this collection, which then drew the attention of the international community who swooped in with as much money as they could muster on short notice in an attempt to save as many of these pieces as they possibly could before they were burned by the German government. The concept of Kunstschutz evolved from those early days into a more formal organization called the 
Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, which translates to the Reichsleiter Rosenberg Task Force, or ERR, during World War II, this group would swoop into territories occupied by the Germans, and they would be armed with lists of known works in the area, and their job was to pack these items up and to ship them back home so that the pieces could be checked over by Hermann Göring, the original founder of the Gestapo, and the second most powerful person in the Nazi party, and the man in charge of the ERR. One purpose of the ERR and the taking of all these artworks was to increase the perception of Germany as the world's center for culture. That they thought taking culture was the same thing as making culture was a questionable opinion on their part, but I suppose the Nazis had a lot of questionable opinions. And among those other questionable opinions that they held is the one that incited the second purpose of the ERR, which was the taking of artwork owned by Jewish families as a means of reclaiming European heritage from those who don't deserve to claim it for themselves. A great deal of this work was stolen from families who became victims of the Holocaust. And the third main reason for the ERR's existence was to provide a steady stream of artwork for Hitler to choose from, for both his personal collection and for the Führer Museum, also called the Linz Art Gallery, which Hitler intended to build near his hometown of Bernau for the purpose of displaying the works taken from around Europe by the Nazis during World War II. He also intended to make this building the first seed planted of a new center of culture and cultural gravity in Germany, so as to eventually overshadow Vienna, which was a city that Hitler despised. It's notable that even Hitler's one-time allies were not immune from his rampant art theft. His people swept into Italy after an armistice was signed that would lead Italy to surrender to the Allied powers. But before Germany eventually attacked Italy to forcefully disarm them in the wake of their surrender, they swooped in to confiscate nearly 500 marble and bronze statues and paintings from the likes of Donatello and Titian and Michelangelo and Botticelli, Raphael, Da Vinci. The only reason many of these pieces were found and eventually returned after the war is that anti-fascist Italian spies followed the Kunstschutz crew as they left Italy for Germany and Austria and fed the location of these stolen works back to their contacts with the Allies. A star-studded movie was released in 2014 called The Monuments Men, which was a story about the Allied version of the Kunstschutz called the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archive, or MFAA, program. This was a group that actually was, in fact, not just for propaganda purposes, dedicated to ensuring the survival, reconstruction, and return of artworks and other cultural artifacts during World War II, and the 400 or so people who worked for the group included prominent future art historians and museum curators. This group, the MFAA, found and returned over 5 million pieces of art and other cultural items during the course of the war. And a group of about 60 MFAA employees continued operating for six years after the war as art detectives searching Europe for hidden Axis stashes of art plunder. And that's what I want to talk about today. Artwork and other things that have been stolen from someone, or a group of someones, and the subsequent effort to make things right, in some cases many generations after the initial theft took place. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is brought to you by its wonderful listeners, 
If you stop by letsnotethings.com, you will find an array of different options, different ways that you can support the show. Everything from contributing directly, monetarily, to sharing it with friends, to leaving a review up on iTunes. Any and all of these methods of contribution are very much appreciated. Thank you so much to everyone who has already done so, and thank you very much in advance if you are planning on doing so in the future. This episode is brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, not only does it help support the show, but it will net you a free month of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice from their immense collection. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is my hosting company of choice, and if you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, you will not only be helping the show, but you will also receive a substantial discount off of their prices. HostGator.com slash LKT. All right, let's get back to the show. So the looting that took place during World Wars I and II are not anywhere near the first instances of cultural artifacts like art being stolen by conquerors from the conquered, and the efforts to return such works in the years since have not been the first efforts to balance the ownership books in that way either. But the thefts that took place during these world wars were notable in their scale, and also in their scope. A lot more art was taken because the means to take it was newly available due to modern technologies and transportation, and because the perception of value of this artwork had changed as the world had become more interconnected. Likewise, the scope of the theft was large because the scope of the war was also massive, encompassing many different nations and continents and their respective works. It's difficult to find numbers for invasion campaigns of the past, by the way, but I'm guessing the amount of theft that took place under, say, Genghis Khan was much greater than under Hitler, because the Khan's success was also substantially greater. That said, it would be difficult to return works to their original owners when those owners and their nations have ceased to be and have come completely under the rule of another entity. If the Nazis had won World War II, it's a safe bet we'd be having a very different conversation about these works and perhaps even hold different ideas about the taking of cultural works and how we should view those who take them. But Germany and their allies were pushed back by the end of the war, and as such, we tend to view these thefts quite unfavorably. Many private owners of Nazi loot, as it's come to be known, are unable to sell these pieces, as the negative perception would not only keep most buyers away, but it would also reflect badly on those who owned the works in question no matter how far removed they might actually be from the criminality that led to their eventual acquisition. And it's this perception that makes the conversation around the return of these works so complicated. There are many informed, involved people on both sides of the question of whether or not cultural works should be returned to their origin after the bullets have stopped flying, or if perhaps we are all better off if we keep them where they have landed. There are four articles that I want to start from and unspool as a unit today, and each addresses a different recent instance of cultural theft and an attempt or demand to make things right by the country of origin or the eventual country of residence of that item. The first is the announcement of a formal request by the Greek government to the French government to return the Aphrodite of Milos statue, which is better known as the Venus de Milo. And this comes from GreekReporter.com. I will link to this and all the other articles here in the show notes. This is a statue that is quite famous now, but it was discovered by a farmer nearly 200 years ago and then sold to a French naval officer. And then it eventually was gifted to 
King Louis the Seventeenth, the mayor of the island of Milos, which is where the statue originated, is the official who issued the formal request for the statue's return from where it is currently on display at the Louvre in Paris. The second article today is from the FBI's website, and the article is about the repatriation of a Roman statue that was stolen from a historic residence in Italy back in 1983. It was one of 15 statues that were stolen, alongside other items from the residence. And this particular statue was sold to a private owner in Manhattan in the late 90s for just over $80,000. The owner voluntarily turned the statue over to the FBI when they discovered it was stolen while trying to auction it off in 2015. The owner, by the way, received no compensation for the statue, but in return for their voluntarily forfeiting it to the FBI, no charges were pressed against them for buying and possessing an illegally acquired cultural artifact. The third article today is from LiveScience.com, and it's regarding a stolen 3,000-year-old mummy's hand. This hand was seized at the Los Angeles International Airport when it arrived in a package labeled as a science fiction movie prop in 2013, and the importer forfeited it to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, alongside a handful, no pun intended, of other artifacts, as part of a larger ongoing investigation known as, and I'm not making this up, Operation Mummy's Curse. The ICE has recovered over 7,000 artifacts from Egypt, Greece, Iran, and Iraq, among others, that were stolen and then shipped illegally to the U.S. since 2009. These objects have all been returned to their countries of origin, and it's noted in the article that as part of this particular effort, they have also found and returned an ancient Sumerian axe that was being sold on Craigslist, and a gold-plated soap dish from Saddam Hussein's palace that was being sold in Connecticut. And finally, the fourth article is from The Guardian, and this article talks about a sign that was stolen from the Dachau concentration camp nearly two years ago, and it was found in Norway just recently. Dachau was established as a prison for political prisoners in 1933, very shortly after Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. During World War II, however, it was converted into a death camp for more than 41,000 Jews and other so-called undesirables, including clergy and intellectuals who refused to tow the Nazi party line, were killed. The entire 220-pound fence door was apparently stolen, though only the sign from atop the fence door was found and returned from Norway. These four articles are just a very small sampling of what is written about nearly every day, which is the discovery and return, or demand for return, of stolen or allegedly stolen cultural works. Many of these cultural artifacts are small, and for the purposes of big zinger news stories anyway, not terribly vital or front page worthy. Pieces of statues and pieces of tombstones and soap dishes from Saddam Hussein's palace in Iraq. Some of these may get a mention on a slow news day, but they themselves are not typically a story. And this is not because they are not important to the culture that lost them, but it's mainly because there are so many bigger fish to fry and so many larger more ostensibly vital or famous artifacts to report on. And it may seem, looking at these articles, that it is an obviously positive public relations move for any government who discovers stolen work from another country in their country to then play ball and ensure that they very publicly give that work back. If a piece of looted cultural history is discovered in your jurisdiction, you return it. That's how this works. It's the right thing to do, says public sentiment. And it is pure douchebaggery beyond belief not to, says the common social morality. 
But there are arguments against the reflexive return of such objects. And I'll, I'll link to some of these on the show notes as well. But the most common that I could find against returning these cultural artifacts are things like the pieces were stolen so long ago that it's difficult to make the argument that you're actually returning it to the people who made it or the culture of origin of that work. The government of Egypt today is not the same as the government of Egypt back in the days of the pharaohs, for instance. It could also be argued that there are benefits of having such artworks and cultural relics disseminated outside of its native culture. And it's also notable and often argued that most of these claims are not made by the original owners of the work, but rather descendants one or two generations removed from the actual creation of the work. And in many cases, this art would be leaving public display, probably at a museum somewhere, and going into a personal closed collection elsewhere. And so far fewer people would actually be exposed to it as a result of returning it. Of course, there are just as many counter arguments, and they are very strong as well. The main ones, though, seem to be that Ownership is an important standard that we need to uphold, even internationally, and even in regard to cultural artifacts, and that those heirs of these works, even though they might be one or two generations removed from the actual creation of them, are themselves of humble means, and they're not looking to benefit from owning these works financially, and therefore returning these pieces back to where they came from is the only moral decent thing to do. It's interesting to note, looking over some of these arguments, the ones that get very specific, that there are a lot of cold, very pragmatic reasons to leave the artwork or to leave these cultural relics where they are, where they end up after a conflict. Whereas there's a lot of emotional arguments made and a lot of emotional words used to argue in favor of returning such art to their original owners, or at least the descendants or heirs of the original owners. I'm not saying that there are no rational reasons to return this artwork. I would argue that if we are going to uphold the ideals of private ownership of anything, it's at least something that we have to consider supporting. And if not, we have to delineate some kind of rule or regulation as to when returning of cultural artifacts does happen and when it doesn't happen. For the future. But there are some surprisingly strong, if again quite cold, rationales given for leaving the art where it is. And in some cases, the people making those arguments are the very same people who lost loved ones to the war and who themselves are would be heirs to priceless works of art that are currently housed in museums around the world. I think the big question, though, whether or not you believe the actual works should be sent back to their place of origin, is how do you balance the books after something like a war or an invasion? How do you right those wrongs, at least to the best of your ability, after so much wrong has been done? Is it even possible? Should you even try? And if you try, how hard should you try? At what point does it become ridiculous or at what point are you actually unable to ever give enough to right those wrongs? Let's put a pin in that and take this conversation in a somewhat different direction toward a case where something was stolen, but not statues or paintings or mummy hands. When the slaves were freed in the United States in 1865, General Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15, which confiscated 400,000 acres of land along the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, so that around 18,000 freed slave families could each have 40 acres of land, and in most cases a mule, so that they might work and own their own land and create their own living. This Special Field Order was reversed shortly thereafter, by President Andrew Johnson after he took power in the wake of President Lincoln's assassination. This reversal returned the land 
and the mules to their previous owners. There were a few efforts to address reparations for slavery before the end of Reconstruction, which was the period of rebuilding the South and a reconciliation between the Northern American Yankees and the Confederates down South after the war. And Reconstruction was a period that lasted from about 1865 until 1877. All of the efforts to address reparations were overshadowed, however, by the oppositional efforts to segregate the country and the subsequent Jim Crow laws that served to amplify and enshrine the inequalities that had existed before the war, rather than neutralizing or doing away with them completely. There are a lot of variables to consider in any discussion about reparations for the families and the descendants of former slaves in the U.S., but also anywhere else in the world where the issue is being raised. You can, in a way, do the direct math and figure out how much earnings the individual slaves might have earned had they been treated as laborers instead of possessions, and then add interests and things like that. But this fails to account for the secondary and tertiary benefits of having a huge workforce that you don't have to pay, and the consequences of having a large chunk of the population not get the vote, and which only later had their population count as three-fifths of what it should have counted for in that regard. This simple math also doesn't take into account the short-term losses of having both numbers and talent disappear, sapped from their home cultures, nor does it account for the revenue generated by the Atlantic slave trade as a whole, inclusive of the profit gained by the European countries that both instigated and profited from the trade, but who also used slaves in their plantations in the Caribbean. So if you take all of that and somehow adhere numerical values to it and add it all up, you still have to somehow account for the long-term consequences of all those short-term variables. How different would the U.S. be today in power, in culture, in population, in wealth, in industrial might? Had these slaves not been used as they were, what value could we possibly ascribe to their contribution on those levels and on so many others, especially considering that their participation was not achieved by choice, but by force, that their entire lives were one big opportunity cost of things that they could have done otherwise elsewhere. I don't even know how you would begin to put numbers on all of that. But there have been efforts to try to do just that. In 2011, a social activist from Chicago proposed that the U.S. government begin making reparations to proven descendants of slaves by providing, for those who wish to stay in the U.S., free education, free medical care, free legal advice, and free financial aid for 50 years, with no taxes levied on any of them. And for those who wished to leave the United States, each of these proven descendants of slaves should receive $1 million or more backed by gold. But even for proposals such as this one, which would no doubt do a great deal to close some of the privilege gap, there's still the major hurdle of identifying who should receive such payments and benefits. The U.S. Census does not keep records of who is descended from slaves, and so identifying who would fit into this category by itself would be a massive undertaking. But that identification process might do additional damage even as it tries to fix some of the damage of the past. Many apologies have been made to descendants of slaves over the years. Britain has apologized a few times. Many individual U.S. states and European nations and even banks have done the same. But these apologies, though important in a way, as a nice gesture and as a recognition that, yes, they or their ancestors did something wrong, they do very little to adjust the reality of the people who suffer the consequences of these past wrongs. And so here's a question that 
I think is worth asking in regards to this topic. Should one generation be responsible for the debts of a past generation? Or asked another way, and a more specific way, should a generation feel guilt and be expected to assuage that guilt when they were not the ones who did the thing they feel guilty about? I think the knee-jerk answer to this question for a lot of people would be no, of course not. I did not do that thing. I do not own slaves, and I never would. And it's ridiculous that my tax dollars should be spent to try to fix the mistakes made by someone with different values than I have, and that were made a long time ago. And I can understand that perspective, but I also can't help but ask myself, is that response entirely rational? Let me posit a scenario real quick to explain what I mean. Let's imagine that your grandfather robbed his neighbor's house, took everything that his neighbor owned, everything from his money to his furniture to the clothes off his back, and then invested the fruits of that theft so that his monetary fortune grew over the years, and there was always plenty of furniture to lounge around on, and there were always plenty of clothes to choose from in the closet, and your parents were able to enjoy those benefits, having grown up in the house of your thieving grandfather, and they actually had even more than grandfather because of the interest earned on that stolen money, and because the money they were able to save because they didn't have to buy any clothes or furniture of their own. There was always plenty to go around. The neighbor's family, however, was behind because the previous generation had to scrounge and save and try to get the fundamentals, try to get new clothes, and maybe invest in a rickety old bed so that by the time their kids came along, they would have something, but they would still be very much behind of where they would have been otherwise. Another generation passes and you arrive and you still enjoy the fruits of that theft. And again, even more so than your parents because of the interest earned on the money that was taken that was put in the bank and because of the interest earned off of all the money that was saved from not having to buy furniture or clothing and because you don't have to spend your money on those things either because you have all that infrastructure in place already. The neighbors, though, are still way behind. And even though they are further ahead than they would have been a generation before, they are increasingly behind your family's home and your family because of that theft that took place and the reverberating effects of it throughout time. Maybe they have some more clothes and some more furniture and a little bit of money now, but it pales in comparison in a dramatic way to what you have available because of something that happened in your grandparents' time period. This is obviously an ultra-simplified, kind of cartoonish example of what we are talking about here. Yes, it is no fault, if you want to call it that, of yours that you were born into a home that has furniture and clothes and plenty of money in the bank, while your neighbors do not. But in this case, those privileges that you enjoy are only there because of a theft that happened long ago. And it wasn't your theft. You didn't do it. But you ended up being the beneficiary of that theft. And this is what we talk about in part when we talk about privilege. I've spoken about this more in depth in a past episode, about how when you have privilege, you don't really notice it. You only really notice privilege if you're the person on the short end of it. And I think that observation is just as relevant here. Yes, it can, at first glance, seem unfair to have to pay a past generation's debt. Because again, that privilege, that difference, does not seem to be relevant to you because you've always had it. On the other hand, Many of us have privilege that our ancestors earned for us on the backs of slaves, on the backs of a great theft. Perhaps one of the biggest thefts that ever happened is to take away people's lives and their freedom. 
we did not do this. And hopefully, if we were given the option today between having less wealth or enslaving other people and having the wealth that we are accustomed to, we would choose not to enslave people and to have slightly less wealth. So why is it any different when we're asked if we would take a slight financial hit in order to balance the books a little in the form of reparations? I don't know that I have a straight answer for this. I am very much aware of the arguments on both sides, but it's also something that, as I mentioned in that past episode, I can be aware of this in an intellectual way, but not having experienced the short end of privilege in a direct way, it's very, very difficult to fully understand all of the arguments that are involved in this conversation. Thankfully, there are a lot of other people who are a whole lot more qualified to speak about this than I am. I will link to some of them in the show notes. One that I will mention here is ta Coates, who, in addition to being a journalist, he has also written two wonderful books and a comic book series for Marvel's Black Panther character, which is also excellent. He has written a piece on this very topic called The Case for Reparations for the Atlantic that is definitely worth taking the time to read if you are curious to learn more about this topic. Now, all of this talk about different types of theft and how we, the new generation, responds to it leads to another big picture idea that I think underlies this discussion. And that's the idea of the evolution of morality over time. And this is something that wasn't as evident, I think, for a very long period of history, because the conquering and taking and crushing of other groups was kind of the way that things operated. And we also didn't have such reliable means of communicating and sharing ideas, so we couldn't see this evolution, but we also couldn't benefit from others learned morality and ideas from other places around the world the way that we can today. But thankfully today, we can do those things and we have benefited immensely. And our ideas about morality have actually dramatically shifted just in the past several centuries. And this is partially because we have things like Westphalian sovereignty, which has resulted in us mostly respecting each other's borders and stuff most of the time. And so we don't have as much to worry about in terms of people just plunging across our borders and taking all our stuff. And so we can afford to intellectualize a little bit more and figure out what we should be as opposed to what we are in a fairly brutal, practical reality situation. But this has also evolved pretty quickly and recently because of a general understanding that has emerged of how thin the lines between different groups actually are and a general concept, if not held by everyone, that we should treat even people who are different from us with a modicum of respect. And not just because it's the right thing to do according to certain modern iterations of morality, but also in a purely pragmatic sense, because it might just be us that is asking for our stuff back next time. And it is nice to have that standard of treating each other this way in place, just in case we are those next beneficiaries of that concept. Now, does this ideology mean that we should go back throughout history and try to make changes to every single historical wrong just because we believe a certain way is the right way now, today? I don't know the answer to that question. I am inclined to say yes, that when possible, we should do this because correcting historical wrongs is part of what allows us to reestablish a new foundation that is predicated on current understandings of morality, which is to say doing this, correcting those historical wrongs where we are able, allows us to feel that we are living in a world in which we are mostly living up to our own standards of what is good, as opposed to having those ideals and failing to do anything about it. On the other hand, I don't know how feasible this would actually be in a lot of cases on a practical level. If we look back to prehistory, which is before we started recording history in a reliable, consistent, long-lasting fashion, 
and which wasn't that long ago, if you think about it, we don't actually have any data about what happened other than folk tales. And even in recorded history, the textbooks or whatever texts we have that give us the data about that time period were often written by those who won the war. So establishing a legitimate understanding of what really happened for most of our recorded history is a difficult proposition. Which cultures recorded truth do we abide by? Whose story do we believe when these stories are in conflict? And it's at this point that I get hung up on any discussion of any type of compensation for ancestors of slaves in the United States or, or any related topic around the world. I think there is a very good argument to be made for something like reparations because the African American community, on average, was put at a huge disadvantage even after they were freed from being possessions. It's actually incredibly messed up that something more wasn't done back in the day, because that's when it should have happened. And if it was, if something was done, it would have still been a travesty, but we wouldn't be dealing with generations-old repercussions of that failure now, today, which has in many ways amplified the divisions that we started out with. And I kind of like the idea that we actually probably could do something about this if we chose to. And I think it shows a certain strength for a community to try to right wrongs, or even perceived wrongs in some cases, just because they can and because they believe it's right. That, to me, is an ideal worth pursuing, if it could, in fact, be made manifest. That said, I do have trouble imagining what it would actually look like in real life. Are we going to go do genetic testing? On everyone who claims to have such an ancestry? Are we going to tell those who have some evidence, but not the kind that we are using, that they are out of luck? Like, if they have written or oral tradition evidence, but no legal documents, are we going to tell them to hit the road? Are we just going to lump all black people, or anyone with black ancestry at all, together? How far back do we go with this? And could it actually worsen the racial tensions that already exist? And would it matter? Is that a viable argument against doing it? Or is it actually a further argument in favor of it? A lot of the issues that are often brought up about the concept of reparations for the descendants of slaves in the United States are related to where the money comes from. But honestly, I personally am less concerned about that than as I am about what the program would actually look like. I think we could find the money we have for other programs in the past, and I don't think it would be a misuse of funds at all, and would quite likely end up benefiting everyone in the country in the long or even the medium term because of the balancing effect it would have for a lot of people who have, by pure dumb luck, been born into a disadvantageous situation. But I've yet to see a real plan for this that is very practical and concrete, even from people who make the most convincing arguments that it should be done. And the same is true regarding many of these claims, be they requests for the return of artwork or requests for compensation for immense historical mistreatment. The other complicating issue here is that it's a very inconvenient precedent to set. Because if we fix this, we will have to fix all similar issues morally, I think. And that means that we will have trouble discussing any individual issue of a historical wrong without also discussing the whole collection in its entirety of our historical wrongs, which means each issue then becomes increasingly more cumbersome rather than somewhat simple and relatively easy to suss apart. It may be that someday we'll come up with some overarching solution for this type of problem. Maybe we will come up with a formula that helps us make things right. Maybe we will establish new types of societies or economic systems or means of sharing intellectual and artistic creations that render the whole point moot. Maybe we will develop time travel so we can go back and see what actually happened, though that could of course create more problems than it solves, depending on the 
nature and mechanism of that time travel and the paradoxes that are made possible as a result. For the moment, though, it helps to be aware of these conflicts and the conversations around them and the issues that they bring to light. There may not be a real, immediate, direct, workable way of balancing the books for the descendants of slaves in the U.S., but being reminded of the issue may allow us to make choices moving forward that achieves the same end in a different way. It may be that a particular government or museum will never be convinced to return a particular work to its purported geographic origin, but it may be that we can come up with ways to make all such works more accessible and share the benefits of having them in a given place so that the issue becomes less of an issue and all parties are able to move forward, happy to be connected with each other and not feeling like they have to check each other's pockets on the way out of every interaction. This episode and every episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by its wonderful listeners, people like you. If you drop by letsknowthings.com, in addition to being able to view the show notes for every single episode, this one included, You'll also find a contributions page, which will give you a bunch of different options in terms of how you can help perpetuate this show, should you choose to do so. This episode was brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com LKT, you will receive a free 30-day pass to Audible and an audiobook from their massive collection of your choice. If you have not yet gotten on the audiobook bandwagon, this is a great way to taste test it. I myself love the hell out of audiobooks. If you do not have a book in mind already to listen to using that credit, might I recommend The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee. The Gene is a work of nonfiction that goes back and looks at the history of the gene of genetics. The stories involved are very well told the historical ones, and the modern-day stories about how genetics are being applied and tested and manipulated today. This is a great overview if you're not familiar with genetics at all, but even someone like me who geeks out on that type of thing, I learned a whole lot. And The Gene is available on Audible as a very well-narrated book, I might add. Very enjoyable to listen to. And if you go to audibletrial.com LKT, you could get The Gene or any other book from their collection for free. It's yours to keep whether or not you stick around with them after that free month. A great way to support the show, but also a great way to get some free additional interestingness in your life. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is the hosting company that I use to host all of my sites, including letsknowthings.com. Their tools are easy to use, their prices are excellent, and they become even more excellent if you go to hostgator.com LKT. So go check it out, another great way to support the show, but also to get hosting services if you are on the market for such a thing. As I mentioned, you can find the show notes on letsknowthings.com. While there, you can also subscribe for the free weekly newsletter, which comes out every Monday and contains an assortment of links to interesting things. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com and a complete list of the books that I've written at colin.io. You can find Let's Know Things on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Let's Know Things. And you can find me, the host, Colin Wright, at Colin is my name pretty much everywhere on the internet. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.